church. Because John is writing this book of Revelation to churches. Let me say for a second, this book of Revelation has been misinterpreted and misused for a variety of things throughout the history of the church, from the day it was written up until now. Because a lot of times we're tempted to look at this book and we're either really excited about studying it because it's cool and there's dragons and swords and blood and all this stuff that, that sounds really cool and it makes for good images. And we become obsessed with, well, what does this mean? And what does that mean? And this and that and the other. And we're missing the theme of the book. Or we're just scared of Revelation and we say, well, there's all this weird stuff in there and it's been so misused. And this is the way a lot of us come to it. It's been so misused and it's so confusing that we don't want to look at it. So we'll just sort of lop it off the back of our Bibles. We won't pay any attention to it. It's just that last book back there. And when people ask us, they're like, well, you know, it's just kind of confusing and we don't really talk about it a whole lot. You know, it's, it's the ugly stepchild of the Bible. And we'll just kind of leave it hanging out there and not talk about it and, and just let it go. So we'll stop at 65 if we look at Jude. Maybe we'll back up a few more than that. But we'll just kind of leave it off. And let me say, on either case, there can't be a book in the Bible more needed in our day than the book of Revelation. Because let's look at our circumstances just as Christians right now in the world and as a church centered in the world. This is a, a world that's becoming increasingly, if not hostile to Christians, at least increasingly ambivalent about it. This is not, we don't live in a Christian culture anymore. And we're in the Bible Belt, center of it. But half, if not quite half, then really close, 49 point something percent, almost half of the people in Greenville County would say, I'm not affiliated with any religion. None. And within the other half, you've got Christians, Muslims, everybody else. It's not like all those people are evangelical Christians who would say, Jesus is the only way to get to heaven. So we've got all those people, and those people are increase, increasingly feel like Christianity is just not something I want to hear about. Not only do I not, I don't believe in Jesus, I don't even want to hear about him. And so they just become, you know, the culture starts to march farther and farther away, and it just feels increasingly difficult just to be a Christian. You see that in laws that are passed and the way people talk about, about Christians and what they are and what they believe. So we've got that going on. And then let's, just us as a church. There's, there's these two sides to every individual Christian, I think, but to, to our church as well. And 95% of Northgate, I think, is excited about where we're going in the future. What's coming in the weeks and the months and the years ahead. We're just excited about how this church has grown. And I've heard those stories that we've been here now for a few months, we're excited about where the church is going, and we're looking forward to all that, and we're, we're just excited to see what God is going to do, and I think he's going to do great things through this church. But there's this little 5% back here that, that goes, and this is in every one of us, and it's in me too, that whenever we're asked to do something else, it's, we just want to hold back a little bit. There's, there's that little piece of me, and I know there is of other people who says, you know, when, when the pastor gets up there and talks about we need to pray, it's just like, oh great, there's another half hour out of my day. That, that i got to take and, and kneel down and pray. Or there's, another, you know, I, I, there's a Sunday afternoon i got to give up once a month to come gather as a church and pray together. Or that says, you know, well, you know, man, I, I feel really convicted about, you know, man, I need to be in my Bible more and everything, but I just I don't know where I can squeeze that into my schedule. I mean, look, we got school starting up, and i got a job over here, and i got this part-time job over there. I'm just trying to make the ends meet, man, and I, I don't have it much time. And now football season started up, so there's three hours out of my Saturday, and, you know... So there's this little piece of us back over here. There's, there's this huge, we're just excited about where it's going, but there's this little tug, and it's, it's, it's holding on tight to say, well, I'm a little bit hesitant. I don't, I don't know if I want to jump in all the way. It's exactly where John and these seven churches were when he gets this vision. If you read through Revelation 2 through 3, you get the letters to these individual seven churches, and you see that each of them had, had different problems. There's a church at Ephesus. Which Jesus tells John, you've forgotten your first love. You've forgotten to make Christ your first priority. He's maybe second or third or fourth or somewhere on down the list. But above that, there's some other stuff. And we don't know what that was for the church at Ephesus. It's probably different for lots of them. For some of them, it could be their careers. For some of them, it could be grades. For some of them, it could be family. Maybe those things weren't bad, but Jesus is saying, you know, I've fallen down in your priority list and I need to be number one. For the church at Sardis, there was just this hesitancy that we talked about here and that all of us feel whenever we're like, man, I, I really need to be doing more. 
but there was this hesitancy. Jesus looks at him and says, you haven't jumped all in. You're neither warm nor, nor cold. You're just kind of sitting there and you can't figure out what you are, whether or not you want to jump all in with Jesus. And he says, that's not going to work. So that's just a picture. They, all these churches all had different problems and different issues. But John writes one book to all of them, and it's the book of Revelation. And the other thing that all those churches were encountering together is that they're in a world that's growing increasingly hostile toward Christians. The early church in that area had had this explosive growth, and they were all excited about where the church was going. But all of a sudden, the Roman Empire had started to take notice, and the people around them had started to take notice. And they're looking at the, these churches and saying, well, this is a problem. You know, you guys are crazy. You guys are nuts. And you got to stop. And so there's this pressure and this putback and just this tension that's, that's growing on the church as it goes forward. And the church is looking around going, well, wasn't Jesus supposed to come back by now? I mean, my goodness, this is hard. You know, we're tired. I, how are we going to do anything other than this? This is all we got. And so they were all looking at John going, you know, all right, you know, when, when's he showing up? Because I'd like to be done. This heaven place sounds pretty cool. It'd be nice to be there now. Let's just go ahead and, and finish this off. So that's where the church was. This, like, wait a second. What, wasn't Jesus supposed to come back? This is getting really hard, John. Like, what's going on? And John himself had, had, could identify. You see there uh, in verses 9 and 10, him talking about his own circumstances. He had been serving these churches, giving his life to them investing everything he had, and what he got for it was to be exiled to the island of Patmos. Now, the island of Patmos today would be a resort town. It's got, you know, this nice little town, it's got a couple of spas, you know, it'd be this play, nice place to go kick back and relax for a little while. But John's been separated from all his friends, and he's been put there as a, as a punishment, as a way to get him out of the way, stop talking about Jesus, don't say anything else about him over here in, in all these churches you've been talking to, get over here on this little tiny island off the coast of what is now Turkey, and the Roman Empire is basically looking at him saying, you just need to, to shut up, sit down, and go away. He had been, John had been, with these churches. He was their brother, their partner in the tribulation, the struggle, and in the kingdom of Jesus, and the patient endurance, this waiting, saying, when is Jesus going to come back? When do I get my reward And now he's separated from all these churches. And God gives him this vision. And this vision is for all those churches, for every problem. Whether it's you haven't prioritized Jesus. Whether it's you can't really figure out if you're all in with Jesus or not. Whether you're, you're following false teaching, as some of these churches were. Whether you're really doing okay. You just need a little encouragement. For all those things, God gives to John this vision. And then the rest of the book. Chapters 4 to the end. And this vision starts it all off. And this is sitting over the, the top of the whole thing because what Jesus was revealing to John in this vision, this, this first little piece of this book of Revelation, was that what John saw in his circumstances was not the total reality of his circumstances. We talked about this. We actually talked about this text in Sunday school this morning. And we talked about this a little bit. What does it mean to say that John had a vision? Does it mean he had a dream? Does it mean he was just, you know, like getting really hungry and he, you know, kind of, you know, fainted for a few minutes and he just had this weird hallucination and, and then woke up? No. God, Jesus, gives him this vision. And for a brief time, on a Sunday morning on the island of Patmos, God opens his eyes and lets him see spiritual realities that are all around us right now that we don't see, that were all around these churches in this day, that they couldn't see either. And... God gives to John this vision of the Son of Man, one like a Son of Man. And that's a reference straight back to Daniel 7, where Daniel had had a vision, and he could see the Ancient of Days, God himself seated on his throne, and coming from him, one like a Son of Man, like the Son of God himself, but he looked like a Son of Man. And Daniel gives a description there that looks pretty similar to what we see John giving here in this text. So when John says that, he looks up and he sees one like a son of man. He's saying, here is the son of God. And he's walking in the midst of these seven lampstands. And verse 20 tells us those lampstands are the churches. These seven churches that all had different problems, that all had started off following Christ, and some had veered away, and some are listening to people that aren't talking about Christ at all anymore, and some couldn't figure out whether they were in and out, or some of them were, were right on track 
John says, in the midst of all of them was Jesus himself walking. Jesus was not seated somewhere way off in heaven. Jesus is not separated from them. John says, I looked and right there in the middle was Jesus. And then he goes on to give a description. But what that means is Jesus walks. Jesus is present in the midst of his church. Which means this morning, if God gave us the same spiritual vision that he gave to John that morning, we'd see Jesus walking. We'd see him here with us. All this stuff that John's about to use to describe Jesus, we get to see that with our own eyes. What John is trying to describe for us is what this Son of Man, the Son of God, Jesus himself, looks like in all his revealed glory. And he's here. So the first message of this, this text is not that Jesus is somewhere distant. Jesus is somewhere off. He, he doesn't know your problems. He doesn't know where you are. He doesn't... John says, no, 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 no. That's not what it's like at all. I, I looked and looked in the middle of the church, in the midst, right in the center, seeing everyone's problems and everyone's issues and their working in their lives is the Son of God. And when John gets this vision, he's not talking about the future. He's talking about the present. And Jesus hasn't stopped yet. In every church that's meeting this morning, in every church that meets, period, in the life of every believer is Jesus. And this picture that we get of him is giving us a description of what he's like and what he's doing. So let's move into this vision and look at these different pieces of, of how John begins to try to describe what the this, this Son of God, the Son of Man was looked like. Or looked like. Look there at verses 13, 13 and following. This first description that First piece that John gives us is that he was clothed with a long robe with a golden sash around his chest. It's a picture it's looking back at the Old Testament where two different kinds of people would wear long robes that went all the way to the floor. Kings and priests. If you were a, a worker, a day laborer, you wore a little bit shorter robe because you're out in the mud and the dirt all day and it'd be nice not to get the bottom of your robe dirty. But if you get to sit around in, an, you know, in a palace or you get to sit around in the temple all day where you got stone floors and it's not quite so filthy, you wore a robe all the way to the floor. It's a way of showing your high position. And if you were a worker, if you had to go lay brick or hang off the side of a building all day, you wore your belt around your chest, around your waist, because it would be nice if your pants didn't fall off in the middle of the day, or your robe didn't open up. But if you didn't have to work for a living and you weren't moving around all the time and everything else, you could wear your sash higher up. So you would wear it up on your chest where people could see it. And you carry, you know, this is, these are the guys walking around like this. High position, dignitaries, and high priests. And this golden sash is just a symbol of his wealth. It's a picture of his, his position, his majesty. This, this is a, a high priest, a king, who's seated above every other king or priest. And it's, and it's a picture of Jesus as the high priest who has made a sacrifice once and for all. And now he's in heaven. He doesn't have to sacrifice anymore. So for all the sins and all the, the guilt and everything else that we carry, John's looking at this figure coming toward him and says... Wait, here's a priest who, who's finished with that, who's dealt with all the sin, it's all gone, and now he's, he's it. He's the high priest who's done the work that no other high priest could do. And he is above everyone else, above every priest, above every king. He is sovereign over everyone. He's a great high priest clothed with dignity and majesty. The second piece of John's description of him is that the hairs of his head were white, pure white, like wool or like snow. In the Bible, gray hair is not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing now. We just sort of tend to think of it that way. We spend billions and billions of dollars every year on hair dye trying to cover up the fact that our hair goes gray. And then we spend billions and billions of dollars not just trying to look young, but trying to act young. Those of you who watched football games yesterday could see that during the commercials, I, I would guess. I didn't, we don't get ABC or I don't have ESPN, so I missed out yesterday. And let me say this morning, walking around, I've seen more Clemson orange this morning than I have in a long time. So. But, but we spend billions of dollars trying to act young. And it, it's not that, that lots of those things are bad. It's okay that we've got hair dye now. If they'd had it then, they probably would have used it. But, but gray hair, white hair in the Bible is a sign of age, but that's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. It's a sign of wisdom and maturity. Someone who has, has learned through life... And, and survived it and now has been through all these experiences and we can go to them and say, okay, how, sh how should I live my life? It's someone with, with wisdom. And this one, like the Son of Man, Jesus coming to him, his hair is pure white. Pure white. He's, 
all wisdom. This is the very wisdom of God walking in the midst of his church. And then John speaks about his eyes like a flame of fire, the third thing. Uh, The son is old. The son of God is old. He's pictured as this old figure with this white hair. But then in his eyes are eyes like a flame of fire. Just the life and vitality that's coming out of his eyes. John describes it as a flame of fire. And I think they're actually like a flame of fire. So this is like the superhero movies when you've got that one character who has laser vision and he can just, you know, all across the room. It's, it's piercing. It's like Superman's x-ray vision. It sees through to the heart. It sees through to the heart of his church. It sees through to the heart of every individual. There is nothing you can hide from this son of man's eyes. Even if he were seated far away from you, but he's right next to you. You can't hide anything from this son of man. He's not only the wisdom, but the insight, the searching of God. He's like God in Psalm 139.1. If you were here for VBS, you heard that uh, verse talked about a little bit. Psalm 139 kind of sat over the whole thing. But Jesus has searched us and known us and discerned our thoughts from afar. So he's the, the majesty, the dignity, the wisdom of God, the insight, and you can't defeat him. Look at the, the next item. He had feet like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. His feet gleamed. They were so bright and they were bronze. In the book of Daniel, you read of these different kingdoms who are pictured as all these different types of of metal, but they're all eventually crushed. And the final figure that that Daniel sees that's going to arise is this one like a son of man, and he's eternal. He will never be defeated. And these feet of bronze are meant to picture stability and strength and his everlasting rule and reign. The fifth item in this list is his voice, like the roar of many waters. It says it's like the roar of many waters, not like the the tinkling cascade of a a small waterfall or even the the louder roar of a large waterfall. Remember, John's on the island of Patmos. What he's envisioning is the sound of waves crashing onto the rocks during a hurricane. I was thinking about this yesterday, I don't know, Friday now, as I was walking around and thinking about this a little bit and as the storm remnants blew through. And different times I've been at the beach when the weather is like that. I don't know if you've been there when it's normally cold, but windy and and rainy, when hurricanes come in, any of those kinds of things. You just hear this roar. Maggie and I, for our first anniversary trip, went to Virginia Beach. That was, we actually made a road trip. And we're at Virginia Beach one night. And of course, the night we were there, a nor'easter's going up the East Coast. And there were these waves crashing along the shore and the wind blowing so hard you could hardly stand up. But what I remember is just the sound of the waves just pounding on the shoreline. And we went out to dinner that night, had the second best Italian meal I've ever had. Uh, but we went out to dinner that night at a little restaurant that was maybe a mile, mile and a half from the beach. And when you got out of the car, you could still hear it. Just the sound of these waves just crashing, pounding against the, the, the beach. But that's how John describes the voice of this one like a son of man walking among his churches. You cannot get away from the fury, the power of this voice. There's nowhere to run, there's nowhere to hide, not only from his eyes, but from his voice. It is so powerful, it rides over everything else. The sixth thing that John sees is that in his right hand he held seven stars. And then in verse 20, Jesus tells John what those stars symbolize. They're the angels of the seven churches. And there's different things that interpreters talk about. Maybe those seven the angels of the churches are actual angels. Or maybe that's just meant to signify the churches or maybe leaders of the churches. But here's what John's trying to get across. Is that Jesus is in control of his church. He's holding them in his right hand. And the right hand was where a king would hold his scepter or where a a general would hold his sword. It's the, the hand of power and control. That Jesus has not let go of his churches. They're not all off doing all these different things and he's not ruling over them. This is, this is Christ pictured as ruling over his church and having them right in the palm of his hand. And then from his mouth, John says, there comes a two-edged sword. There's actually two different types of swords in the New Testament. This one's a, a Thracian cavalry sword. And it had this long sweep to it. And what would happen when people would go into battle against people carrying this sword is that you would... As infantry, you would be standing here, and here come these these horses coming down up against your line. And if you're on the ground and a horse is coming to you, that's not very good to begin with. But then out from 
from the saddle, the warrior riding this horse pulls out this sword and it's got this long curve to it. And this cavalry would crash into the lines and the sword would just sweep down and sweep off your head. And there was nothing you could do about it. You were just defenseless. So this sword is, is a picture of terrible and final judgment. Everybody who recognized this sword in, in that day would see that this was, this was terrible and final judgment coming on you, against which you just couldn't stand. In Isaiah 11.4, Isaiah looks forward to the day when Jesus was going to come, and we're told that Jesus will judge the poor with righteousness and decide with equity for the meek of the earth, and he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. So for the poor and the meek, this man coming with terrible judgment was, was justice and, and righteousness coming. But for those who were wicked, those who were evildoers, this, this was a sign of final judgment. That your day had come and the reckoning was here. Now the last thing in this list that John says is that his face, and this is important, his face was like the sun shining in its full strength. Most of you know, many of you read my bio or have talked to me since then. I was a, a physicist before uh, going to seminary and answering God's call in my life. And, but even before that, as a kid, the reason I got into it is because I liked astronomy. But if you've ever read any books or you're into astronomy, and I've heard this hundreds of times as I would look at telescopes or anything else, it's don't look at the sun. It's really, really, really bright. It'll damage your eyes. You can't look at it for more than just a split second. You have to look away. John says, the glory of this son of man's face who was walking in the midst of his churches was so bright that it was like the sun shining in its full strength. You could not look at it. That's the glory of the son of God. And we'll come back to that in a second, but here's a, here's a, good, a good rule of thumb for Genesis, or for, Genesis for Revelation or for or any other book of prophecy where you get all these kind of this description of, of, of a figure. Don't lose the forest for the trees this morning. Each of those pieces is all just adding up to give us this picture of the Son of God. Jesus, in all his revealed glory, revealed as everything he is. John had seen him in his flesh, walking around looking like, like one crushed for our iniquities. He'd seen him hanging there on the cross. And he'd seen him after the, the resurrection, bearing the scars in his hands. But this is now Jesus revealed as a son of God in all his glory, everything. And John's looking at it and seeing it, and he's saying, the majesty, the dignity of this high priest who made one final sacrifice for us. Look at the, the wisdom and power of God himself. The judgment that he had, the glory that he had, the power of his voice and his eyes, that could, his eyes that saw right to the heart of these churches and these people that were sitting there, this voice from which they could not escape. He says, this is what Jesus looked like. So the very first thing to these churches, some of whom are struggling and some of whom have turned away from Christ and some of whom just need this encouragement, John does it right off the bat and Jesus does it right off the bat. Start encouraging them or correcting them or anything else. He just gives them this vision of the Son of God in all his glory. And what that's saying to us is this is the most important thing. That's where we've got to set our eyes. That's the thing we need to be gazing at. The Son of God in all his glory. And it's texts like this. We don't have those spiritual eyes this morning. But we have texts like this in our Bibles. From cover to cover, the Bible is, is unveiling this one who's coming and who came, and who is now walking in the midst of our church, who's here with us this morning, the Son of God. The whole thing, cover to cover, talks about His glory, His power, His majesty. And the question when we, when we focus our gaze on that is, what's to be our response? Look at verse 17. I think this is the coolest verse in the whole Bible. I fell at his feet as though dead, John says. It's a common, th common thing sometimes in certain circles to hear. You know, when I see God, I'm going to run up and ask him a question. Or, or when I see God, I'm going to run up and give him a hug. Or when I get to heaven, I'm going to do this or that. Or... This is how the Bible pictures everyone coming into the presence of God in all his glory. It's just 
falling at his feet. This, this is worship. We, we talk about worship, and it's good that we do. We talk about worship as singing, and there's singing in Revelation. And we talk about worship as, as using instruments and things, to, and that is worship. But worship in the Bible is not just those things. It's everything. It's, worship in the Bible is all of life lived in submission to God. And this is worship as well. When you come into God's presence as a sinner, this is what happens. And we see that over and over again in the Bible. In Joshua 5.14, an angel shows up. Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped. And that's just the sight of an angel. In Ezekiel 1.28, when Ezekiel gets a, a vision of the glory of God and he just sees a piece of it, Ezekiel says, Such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of, God, uh, glory of the Lord, and when I saw it, I fell on my voice. I fell on my face. And when an angel comes to Daniel in Daniel chapter 8, verse 17, the angel came near to where I stood, and when he came, I was frightened and fell on my face. And then in Matthew chapter 17, verse 6, when Jesus goes up on the mountain at the transfiguration and is revealed to those three apostles in all his glory, it says, when the disciples heard this, the, the voice pronouncing over Jesus, this is my son, when the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. <clears throat> this is how the, the Bible pictures us coming into God's presence. Most commonly, this is it. Just terror. And the reason for that is, is this. All of us worship something. All the time. All of us are worshiping something right now. Worship is just assigning praise and value to something. It's saying, this is important, so I'm going to think about it, and I'm going to pursue it. We're all worshiping something. And the reason that John here is worshiping in fear, the reason he fears this object of his worship coming, is this. For everything else, if you come up with an exception, tell me on the way out, because I've been thinking about this for two weeks. So if you could come up with an exception, let me know. But for everything else, we fear the absence of what we worship. It's common to hear people talking about worshiping money. But think about it. When we worship money, what we're really doing is, is we're afraid of the absence of it. When we're pursuing it all the time and saying money is the most valuable thing and working ourselves to death and trying to gain more and more and more money, what we're saying is, I, I don't want to be without it. What, if, if I don't have enough money, how am I going to pay the rent? How am I, how am I going to pay the bills? How am, I, how am I going to buy that thing that I want? And so we pursue it and we go after it. And it becomes our priority. Some of you here this morning are single. Maybe the object of your worship is marriage. And you fear not having a spouse. You fear that the absence of that companionship and that, that person in your life. And so you date and go after that. and you know, You're going out with guys and girls on blind dates and doing all kinds of crazy stuff. And you, you're trying to find that, that spouse. And that's, that's okay. But when we're worshiping it, we start, we start raising it up. And we just get terrified. We're not going to find this person. We do it with pleasure. We fear the loss of our time, and so we do whatever we can to protect our time, to make sure that we've got a couple hours to sit down and watch the football game or to do whatever. And if something intrudes on that, if, if family or, or what, something the church is asking us to do or anything intrudes on that, we get angry and upset. It's like, why have, I, why have I got to go do that? This is why I put a fridge right by the couch so I wouldn't have to leave the couch. So I could, you know. But we fear that. Everything in life, we fear its absence, and we try to control it. I want to make sure I've got it. And we're seeking to control what we worship. And I mentioned Isaiah earlier, but he points out this, the, the folly of this. In Isaiah 44, chap, uh, verses 18 through 20, Isaiah is talking about idolatry, this worship of things other than God. <clears throat> and he talks about idols made of wood, but we make idols. We make things we worship out of other things. I mentioned money. I mentioned marriage. We could mention thousands of others. But Isaiah says this, No one considers... Nor is there knowledge or discernment to say, half of it I burned in the fire, this log that he's talking about. Half of it I burned in the fire. I also baked bread on its coals. I roasted meat and have eaten. And I make the rest of it an abomination? Shall I fall down before a block of wood? He feeds on ashes. A dulled heart has led him astray, and he cannot deliver himself or say, is there not a lie in my right hand? 
What Isaiah pictures is taking this log and splitting it in two pieces and throwing part of it in a fire so that you can keep warm and bake bread and with the other half of it making a god that you set up and fall down to and worship. We don't do that with logs. Unless maybe you're a lumberjack. But we don't do that with logs. We do it with other things. With money, with pleasure, with time, with whatever. We're trying to control it with this hand and figure out how we've got enough of it. And with this hand we bow down and worship it. And we put it in that position of first priority and we say everything else in our life is going to revolve around this. Because we're afraid that once it's gone, it's gone. It could be grades. It could be time. It could be anything. We fear that we're going to lose it. Because deeper down underneath all those things is this reality that all of us have and have faced is that we're not satisfied. And there's some longing deep in our heart for something. And that something is God. And we can cover it up with other things, but deeper down is this longing. And finally, John, who has worshipped Christ and who's longed for him, finally comes face to face with him, and he realizes there's another problem, a a deeper problem. And the reason that people are running from God and trying to find other idols anyway, it's that John comes into his presence and he's terrified. Here, the one thing in the universe that's worthy of our worship... Everything else we're worshiping, we fear losing it. Here, the, very, the presence of the very one who's come in, and we need to worship him, and John is terrified. And he falls on his face as one though dead. And the reason for that goes all the way back to Genesis. There's a reason Revelation is the last book and Genesis is the first book. Because in Genesis chapter th- chapters 1 through 3, you read how God made the entire world and... Maggie actually got to have a conversation with Samuel this week, our oldest uh, child, the four-year-old, and he was um, asking about this, and they've been learning about creation at preschool, so she was talking him through the story, and, you know, God made everything, but then, um, you know, God made everything good, and he wanted to spend time with Adam and Eve, and Maggie said, but then, you know, Adam and Eve sinned, and, and they were separated from God. And the first question out of Samuel's mouth, he never hesitated, was, well, how did God fix it? It's the same problem. He saw immediately the same problem that John's running up against right here. How did God fix it? Because in Genesis chapter 3, after the fall, after Adam and Eve had rebelled against God, God comes into the garden in verse 18, and you read in Genesis chapter 3, verse 18 through 20, that here God has come, and Adam and Eve go hide, and God comes to them, this one with flaming eyes of fire who sees through everything. It's kind of hard to hide under bushes when the guy can burn them with his eyes. But here comes... God, and he says, why, why did you hide, Adam? And he said, well, I was afraid. That God's presence came. The one we were supposed to, we were created to worship, and we were afraid. It's the very same thing that happens here. Here comes Jesus, and John falls on his face, and is terrified, because we've got a problem. And what does Jesus do? Jesus, who was walking in the midst of the churches, comes to John, and John's on his face, so he doesn't see this, and he puts his hand on his shoulder and says, Do not be afraid. The last time in the Bible, if you read from the beginning to the end, the last time in the Bible that God has touched a man was when he took the rib out of Adam's side and fashioned the woman. And the next thing we read is that men fell rebelled against God, and there was sin, and there was separation from God. God cast them out of the garden. And from then on, man is separated from God. And it's not just that God can't touch us anymore, that we can't have the fellowship that God had with man in the garden, Adam and Eve in the garden, where he could throw his arms around them. It's that we can't even look at him. You get to Exodus chapter 33, and here's Moses, the, the, the most holy, the most devout figure in the Bible. And Moses says, God, I, I want to see your glory. And God goes, well, I'll, I'll, I'll cause all my goodness to pass before you, Moses. I'll let you see a little bit. But he says there that man shall not see my face and live. You can't even look at God and survive. That's the problem the Bible sets up. It's the problem Jesus came to answer. You see that in the rest of this text. But here comes, here's, here's John, and he sees Jesus, God, in all his, his glory, and he falls down at his feet. He knows the problem, he's terrified. And Jesus comes up, and for the first time since Genesis, we see that God touches a man. And Jesus, in all his glory, puts his hand on his shoulder and says, Don't be afraid. 
Why? Look at the, the rest of those verses. Do not fear. Do not fear. I am the first and the last and the living one. John, I am God, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the living one. I am the eternal one. I am God. And behold, I died. And I am alive forever and ever. This is Jesus looking back at his resurrection. I died, and I'm alive forever. And not just did I die, and I live forever, but look at what comes next. And I have the keys of death and Hades. I, I, I am God. I came, I lived, I died, I live again. And death can't beat me again. It didn't beat me the first time either, because look what I did. I conquered it. I didn't just die and come back to life. I took the keys with me. And if you've got the keys, you control the gates. So now anyone who's in this kingdom who's following Jesus gets to fall on your face before the one that you're following, that you're worshiping, and here he is holding the keys of death and Hades, death and hell. And he makes those decisions about who lives and who dies. It's up to him now. He's, he's healed it. He's fixed it. He's fixed the problem. Our proper response when we come into God's presence because of his holiness and his majesty and the fact that we are sinners is terror. And here Jesus is saying, John, I fixed it. And here's a choice that Jesus is putting before John. He's putting before each one of us and he's putting before our church. What are you going to worship? This is the theme of the book of Revelation. It's the theme of John cha uh, Revelation chapter 1. It's the theme of, of chapters 2 and 3 as we're dealing with the individual problems of these churches. It's the theme of the rest of the book. It's worship. And the question it's putting in front of us is, who are we going to worship? What are we going to worship? Jesus or something else? Because at the end of our lives, whether Jesus comes back or whether we all die and we meet him somewhere else, we're all going to have this same thing. We're going to see Jesus in all his revealed glory. And the question is... Are we going to fall at his feet and worship him there as, as one who worships, as one who has said all their lives, you have been my wholehearted desire. You have been priority one. You, I put everything into following after you. Are we going to say that? Because if so, he's going to put our ha his hand on our shoulder. He's going to say, don't fear. I got the keys right here. You, you don't need to fear death or hell or anything else. I've got the keys right here. This is it. It's good now. I fixed it. Don't Don't worry. Look, look over there, there's my father. Look at him, him smiling at you. He's going he's to say over you, well done, good and faithful servant. Or, we could see him and fall down in his face as one terrified. And him look and say, I, I never knew you. There, there's the door. And you're going to slide in the gates of death and hell and they'll shut behind you and the keys are going to be in the hands of the living one. Who stands on the outside? That's, that's the question in front of, of every one of us. So here's the question this morning, and I'll close with this. What's, what's, what do we worship? And not just what do we worship part of the time, what do you worship all the time? Because here's the reality. Right now, in our midst, this Son of God is walking and moving. And he's right here with every one of us. He knows what's in your heart, and he knows what's in the heart of our church. He sees through to the very center of all that. And you cannot escape his gaze. You cannot escape his voice. You cannot escape anything. And it's all asking you this same question. Deep in your heart, what are you holding on to first of all? When you've let go of everything else, what is your fist still closed around? Is it Jesus? Or is it something else? If it's something else, all those things will fail. But if it's Jesus... You'll finally arrive there at those gates and Jesus will say, I've got the keys. Don't fear. Don't be afraid. And once we've made that choice, what are we going to do with it? John's commanded to write to the churches. Our job is to proclaim him, to do the, basically the same thing, is to proclaim him. So what are we going to do when we leave? And what we do shows where, what we're grabbing onto. What, at the core of our hearts, is the deepest thing that we're worshiping. Because if it's Jesus, we're going to proclaim him. We're going to walk out and say, everything else out here doesn't matter. Look, they, Jesus is out here and he's seeing all this stuff. And he holds the keys uh, of death and hell. So I've got to share him. I've got to talk about him. 
I got to get my friends. I got to get my family. I got to get everybody on board. Because if they don't worship Jesus, it, 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 it's all for nothing. What's our response this morning? What's your response this morning? Because we get this question every day when we wake up. What is the first thing, the very first thing on our hearts? What is the deepest thing? What is the thing we hold on to the hardest? Is it something else? Or is it Jesus? Let's pray. God, what a magnificent picture. Uh, you have given us of your Son in all his glory. And God, that is the deepest longing of our hearts, to see him, to have fellowship with him again. It's what you made us for. And God, this sin problem that we have that separated us, that meant that we could not look at you, we could not spend time with you and live, you've dealt with that. That part is done. And God, now the only question is, are we going to follow Jesus or not? Are we going to worship you or not? And God, I pray in this time... If not in this time, then later on today, this week, that you would just, your voice and your gaze and everything would just weigh on our hearts so that we would weigh and say, what is it we worship first? What is it we hold on to the tightest? Or what is it we, we put our allegiance behind? Is it something else? Or is it your son? God, reveal that to our hearts in this time as we reflect and uh, every day to continue to put this before us. What do we worship? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This altar is going to be open in a second. Maybe you're here and you've never heard about Jesus before. And swords coming out of his mouth and everything else sounds pretty scary. But, but think about that. I mean, John sees all this and Jesus says, Fear not. I, I've, I've dealt with all your problems. So don't be afraid anymore. But all Jesus says you need to do is come. Follow me. That's it. And to any who follow him, he gives the right to become children of God. That's open invitation. doesn't take anything from you other than saying, I'm a sinner. Let me fall at the feet of the one who's dealt with my sin. So this altar is open. Come talk to me. Pray where you are. But wherever you are, don't let today slip away without making that decision to say, I'm going to follow the one who's, who solved my problem. If you're here this morning and you're a Christian, but you say, well, you know, Jesus is sort of slipping a little bit. He's, he's still number one, but I need a little encouragement or... Maybe you slip to number two or number three, and it's not the thing your, your heart's worshiping above all. This is open. Pray where you are. But get that straight. Let's all stand.
I hope uh, this week uh, God will open all our eyes so we can see Jesus and worship him. I hope to see all of you guys back here Wednesday night. I'm excited to hear from James, hear more about his testimony, and uh, just have some time to spend with him and to spend some time with you guys at dinner. Uh, looking forward to that again. Uh, let's bow our heads and pray, and we'll be dismissed. Uh, Father, we love you. We thank you again for this opportunity to come and to worship you. And God, we pray, uh, as we just think about this text this week, that we would make sure that our hearts desire the thing we hold on to the most, the hardest, is Jesus. God, open our eyes to see him and to behold him and to love him this week. And God, we thank you so much uh, that he is the first and the last, the living one who's died and who's been resurrected. And God, who lives forevermore with the keys of death and Hades in his hands so that we no longer need to fear anything where nothing can separate us, neither height nor depth, death, life, things present or things to come. Nothing can separate us from the love of Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Thank you.